け Welcome those who have joined us in the live stream. We're in Amos still, and this will be our 44th lesson in Amos. We're going to be commence the eighth, eighth chapter tonight. All right. So they can still be here at night. They just might be behind. <clears throat> Those of you familiar with, with the scripture know that in the word of God, leaven is a type both of the kingdom of God and of sin. Jesus said of the kingdom of heaven, the uh, kingdom of God, the kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven. Okay, so that's, the, that's one use of it. But also it's a type of sin also. Mm -hmm. Beginning his remarks with the statement, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Paul wrote to the Corinthians, purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye be, be, be a new lump, and let us not keep the feast, that's the Lord's table, with the unleavened, with the old leaven of malice and wickedness. I mention this because Amos is dealing with a nation that sin had crept in like leaven mm -hmm. and filled the whole nation of Israel. It had spread into their entire society. It caused them to abuse the poor and injustice to happen. It moved the people to give the Nazarites wine to drink, mm -hmm. yeah. inducing them to break their vows to God. The priesthood had become corrupted. The people had lost their ability to know what is right. These are statements all made in. And they honored idols and built altars to idols and worshiped idols. They became so hardened toward God that they could not respond properly to chastening. They, it got that bad. Their religious customs were tainted. It infected their political structure. Slowly over a period of time, sin came to dominate every facet of the life of Israel. Now this are, these are written for an example. This is how sin works. The only thing accessible to us that can stem the tide of iniquity is godly people. God will work through them to do this. Yeah, amen. If the church becomes weak, there is no hope yeah. for any nation yeah, yeah. where that exists. I want to be clear about this. God is not going to turn to some other institution yeah, that's right. to correct uh -huh. a decadent nation. It, this will not happen. The church is the pillar and ground of the truth, and if it is weak... You can pray from now till Jesus comes, and nothing's going to change until the church is converted. Yeah, that's the way it is. That's why it's so serious. See, that's why a deficient church, that's why this is so serious. Now, many confessing, professing Christians would acknowledge that the church is in a bad shape so far as the general, generalities are concerned at the way, the way God looks at things. He calls seven churches, Jesus called them his churches. He called their ministers his ministers. He said they were in his hands, but five of these were in bad shape. 
So God, when he looks at his church as a whole, he looks at everybody who professes. Whether they're in or not, that's something he did. But he, if wherever a profession is made, mm -hmm. God considers that under the umbrella. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. oh, that's why he, he weighs the churches. Yeah. No. Normally people will, the, normally Christians have somehow they, they received this idea that they can will themselves out of any kind of a situation. That if they if they see defects, they can kind of they can work their way. They can they can recover themselves. But see, yeah, I'm here to tell you, that's not always true. There is a case where they can't. We're going to have it right here in this text, where God gave up on the people. That's what he did to the Gentile world. He gave up on it. Yeah. yeah. Turned it over to their own lusts. Uh, yeah. Now, we'll expound on this a little more carefully as we go through here. Now, the extent of the uh, ferocity of God's judgment is, like, startling. <laughs> you don't ever want to forget things like the flood in Sodom and Gomorrah and some of the plagues and the Egyptian plagues. You know what? Because this is the real God that does these things. He has, as far as we know, ceased to do this. It's only when you're in Christ that you're insulated against all this, all this kind of thing. Now we're going to look at the first three verses of the eighth chapter. <coughs> Thus saith the Lord God, thus hath the Lord God showed unto me, and behold, <clears throat> a basket of summer fruit. And he said, Amos, what seest thou? And I said, a basket of summer fruit. Then said the Lord unto me, the end is come upon my people Israel. I will not again pass by them any more. <clears throat> and the songs of the temple shall be howlings in that day, saith the Lord God. There shall be many dead bodies in every place. They shall cast them forth with silence. That's a <clears throat> I guess you're glad that I'm teaching the text tonight. This is God. This is the way God, this way God talks where sin prevails. This is... This is an example. We're being exposed to God. Thus hath the Lord showed unto me. It's axiomatic. Axiomatic means it's taken for granted. We assume everybody knows this. That God does not show everything to everyone. Does it? God doesn't do this. <clears throat> There are things he has showed everyone. There are things like that. He has made his power and Godhead known in creation. And there's no place where the testimony is not found. That's why the psalmist wrote, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day utter his speech. Night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language. Where their voice is not heard. So anytime a missionary goes to any country, they've already had a testimony. Yeah, right. yeah. Yeah. They can't go say it. Nobody knows. Nobody's heard. They can't say this. God's given a testimony that everybody has ever lived has got this testimony. Yes. Say, so what does that mean? I mean that's where you start. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's where you start there. You don't start saying you don't know anything. They do know more than you think. Yeah. God has showed it to them. <laughs> there's no question that this testimony, there's no language or speech where it's not heard, has been ignored. We know, we understand that. Few people have taken the time to examine it, if any, and no one has really got the message on their own. The only one that really got the message about God's power and Godhead are people he showed it to personally. Yeah. Otherwise, they didn't. They didn't see it. <clears throat> That's something he shows everybody. 
There are critical aspects of the kingdom, however, that are not that should deal with God's nature that aren't shown to everybody. You have to be at a certain level before you can see them. No matter how telling the indicators are of what God has done, of what he's doing, if a person isn't shown it, they won't see it. Shown by God, unless God shows it. Well, your own life will testify of this. If you, if you review the things you've seen, you didn't stumble across them. May seem like that, but you didn't. There, so there are some things that everybody, all men everywhere should repent. That's a message. Who would have all men to be saved. That's, see, there's a message that delivered to all people, but, but not all messages are that way. Now, in the case of Israel, they had provoked God with their thoughtless ways, their vanity. Yet, that's not how it seemed to them. It looked like everything was going fine. The religion was flourishing. The crops were coming in. The cities were in good shape. Families were well. They hadn't been invaded. It looked like everything was really going well. But it wasn't. Some of the false prophets, after they heard Jeremiah tell them a doom is coming, you know, and they didn't like it, they said, sword and famine shall not be in this land. <laughs> refused to accept it. And I remind you that Jesus said to the Jews of his day that they, they spoke well of the false prophets. That's what he told them. Luke 6, 16. They spoke well yeah. of the false prophets. Now God is going to show him as something that he will not show those who have rebelled against him. The Lord showed unto me. This is now the third time Amos said the Lord showed me. This is, some people live their whole life and they haven't been shown anything. He said, he was three times already. He's showing him something that Amos is to make known. <clears throat> he showed me a basket of summer fruit. Be interesting to observe what the average Christian, what their comments would be about that. Showed me a basket of summer fruit. Some verses read ripe fruit. Some say end of summer fruit. Some say basket of figs. The Living Bible says ripe fruit. Message Bible says fresh fruit. Amplified Bible says ripe and therefore soon to perish summer fruit. Now if you look at the I'm not big up on this, but it, if you look at the lexical meaning of the word ripe, the technical meaning of it signifies the harvest of fruits, not of grain, strictly speaking, the cutting off of the fruit. Harvest to be the, to be understood, is, that's what you harvest is ripe, but that's what it means. Some of the other versions, see, they try and explain it. But it means just exactly what the yeah. authorized version says, a basket of summer fruit, that's exactly what the word means. Albert Barnes said of this, and I think it was good, the fruit was the latest harvest in Palestine. When it was gathered, the circle of husbandry was come to its close. That's what he's talking about. This wasn't the harvest of first fruits. See, Pentecost celebrated the harvest of first fruits. This, this was last fruits. Harvest of last fruits. The end of summer. 
It's going to denote God's, I've done, my, I've done all I'm going to do for you now. This is the end. This is what he's going to tell them. The harvest is past. Yes. past, the harvest is ended, and we are not We're saved. not saved, yes. 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 That's what Rabbi Jeremiah said that, yes. So God says to Jeremiah, uh, to Amos, he says, Amos, what, 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 what do you see? See, the Lord's intending for the vision to be understood. Mm -hmm. Amos is to concentrate on this, concentrate on this vision. What, 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 is, what do you see? Some people would say, well, I, that's a pretty intricate basket there. That's what some people would see. See, woven, very. Some people say, well, I see that there's a, they named the kind of fruit that was there. But Amos, he, he said, I see a basket of fruit. <laughs> he, saw, he saw exactly, he, he saw exactly what it was. See, you'd be surprised at what people will see in the Word of God, what they will see. You'll read something, you'll just see this and that, you'll ask them, they just they hardly see anything. They just see some insignificant something, that, or they see something to argue about. Or what do you see? How often the Lord emphasizes, He asks people questions like this, about whether you picked up on what I, what I said or not. Let's, some of the expressions, I'll give you some of them. <clears throat> Jesus says things like, He that hath ears, to hear, let him hear. Yeah, yeah. That's like saying, what do you see? Yeah, that's right. mm -hmm. Again, he said, let these sayings sink down into your ears. Uh -huh. That's what do you see? Yeah. Pond, ponder these things. Mm -hmm. Again, he said, blessed are your ears, for they hear. You, you got something, whoa, blessed are you. Yeah. Blessed art thou. Robert Cobb, blessed and not. Yeah. This is the way it is in the kingdom of God. Matthew thirteen eighteen, he said, "Hear ye, therefore." Yeah. Well, what do you what do you see? Yeah. Matthew fifteen ten, hear and understand. Yeah. Oh, oh, that does God think this way? Yes, He does. Hear and understand. Yeah. Which means there's grace to do that, of course. Again, he said in Mark 4.24, Take heed what you hear. Mm -hmm. And again, My sheep hear my voice. Yeah. See, this. What, do you, what do you see? The Lord says, He that hath the Spirit hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He says that seven, seven times in the book of Revelation. Yeah. That's the same thing of saying, what do you see? There's an invariable mark that identifies those who are falling or have fallen away. They cannot hear the voice of God. They cannot see what God is showing. This is a mark now of a fallen generation or a fallen people. It's merciful of the Lord to do this because it's like He's pointing our attention to what He wants to emphasize. Mm -hmm. He's He's, That's saying, right. he's showing this vision, That's right. but then He's calling the attention of the prophet to what He wants him to Amen. see. Amen. Uh -huh. You can see this, I trust, that people that are distanced from God, not only do they not see, God will not let them see. God will pour out the spirit of deep sleep upon them. He'll close their eyes. He'll close their seer's eyes. He'll close their prophet's eyes, and they'll not be able to get anything that God says. That's the kind of people we're dealing with here. Isaiah 29.10, God said he'd do that. You're all right. All right. You've rejected me so long. I've been patient. I've been long-suffering. Now I'm going to make it impossible. For you to see. Amen. Deep sleep. Deep oh, sleep. Yeah. That's right. Over the uh, people, so they cannot see, nor can they. That's hear. right. As he said that very thing in that text, deep sleep poured out a spirit of deep sleep. Yeah. That's his reaction 
to the refusal of the people. He doesn't do this to people who've never heard or he doesn't do it to them. It's what he does. We're being exposed to God here. Therefore, he, because of this requirement, he says to Amos, well, what, what, do you, what do you see? And he said a basket of summer fruit. It's something like when they let that net down with all the animals to Peter. He, he, he saw, well, a net let down, all men are unclean. He was able to identify the, the animals in the nets. He, he saw. When Jesus was transfigured, there's a vision appeared there. It was a vision because he told them, don't tell anybody about this vision. They saw Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. They, they, they were given to see. They saw what was, what was happening. All valid learning in the kingdom of God begins with what God has said and done. That's where it starts. Now, if a person is a sectarian, they begin with tradition. They make sure all the people understand the tradition of this certain sect, whatever it is. They begin there, and then they work. This isn't where God begins. He begins with what he has said and what he has shown. That's the starting point. So you can't start with some philosophical view of things. You can't start with something men have defined. I could name some of these things, but I'm not going to. You, you can't start with a human assumption. So as we all know, and then make the statement, you've got to begin where God has made things known. That's where you have to start. You don't start with what men have said, and then go to the Bible. Yeah. Yes. Because God will say, God will say, what do you see? And he won't say that, a tradition. Uh -huh. Maybe you've, got, you've been exposed to tradition. I was exposed to tradition. I speak for myself. So the Lord didn't say to me, what do you see there in that tradition? Yeah. I had to go back to what he said. I had to get my eye off. God says something. That's exactly right. That's the only thing I can get yeah, hold of. That's right. That's good. <clears throat> yes. As you're farther along in the Lord, you get clearer vision and sharper hearing mm -hmm. the closer you are to Him. That's right. Because the blind man that Jesus healed, for the first time Jesus asked him, what do you see? It was, I see men as trees walking. That's right. His vision wasn't clear enough to see things for what they really were. And when God spoke from Sinai, some said it thundered. They, they couldn't hear what it was really for. Mm -hmm. So when, when you're farther along and God asks you, what do you see, what do you hear, you know what it is because you're farther along and you can That's see right. things clearly and hear what he's telling That's you. That's right. Mm -hmm. It proves your vision. Yes, we're in Amos 1. Oh, we're glad you're here. We're worried about you. Don't worry anymore, brethren. Yeah. <laughs> your Williams brethren are here. What do you see, Amos? I see a basket of fruit. Mm -hmm. All right, now that you've seen it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to you about this. Then said the Lord unto me, The end has come upon my people of Israel. I will not again pass by them anymore. Yeah. Could you bear to have God say that about someone you know? Hmm? Some people couldn't. Yeah. Well, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be delightful for anybody. But this is what he said. Then, I like the word then. Once it was confirmed that Amos saw what he was showing, then we could proceed. Peter said, well, I don't see anything. I just, it looks like something come down from heaven. I don't know, I don't know what it was. It's, something's in it, but I, in that ba something's in that basket, but I can't detect what it is. See, until, until it was confirmed that Amos saw what God did, yeah. we're not going to proceed any further. Now, there are some things like that, brethren. If you can't see what God has said about a matter, the explanations aren't given. Mm 
you, you've got to see what, not what he meant, what he said. See, there's a big difference. Translators of the Bible have not learned this. Yeah, that's right. You don't tell people what you think it meant. Yeah. You've got to begin with what it says. Amen. And most of these new versions are commentated. Commentate. Mm -hmm. That's right. Can't even think of the word. Commentaries. Commentaries. That's what they are. They're telling you what they think it means. But no person handling the word of God has a right mm -hmm. to say what they think something means and call that a Bible. Yeah. Amen. Amen. No one has that right. Now, I'm saying that because, you see, it see, sounds straightforward. I see a basket of fruit. That's it. Yeah. But, see, some people wouldn't have, they wouldn't have said that. Mm -hmm. They'd have used some other words. Oh, but you yeah. had to see exactly. Now that you've seen what I've put down before you, uh, yeah. I'm going to proceed. Then mm -hmm. the Lord said unto me, mm -hmm. now, as I mentioned, the Lord often speaks to everybody. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. See, that's something he says to everybody. Mm -hmm. Times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. See, that's something message says to everybody. But these words are not for everybody. What he's going to say here now. Yeah. And, there, and he's going to ask for a response. Immediate response. This is not only the manner in which God speaks, he's, it's the way he addresses specific individuals or groups of individuals too. He says something, then he demands that they res have an appropriate response mm -hmm. yeah. to what he said. God said things to Adam and to Cain and Noah and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and a host of other people. But it just wasn't I had the privilege of hearing God. It, yeah. That's how people would look at Well, I was really blessed. God said something to me. Well, that was a blessing. But you got to do something mm -hmm. with what God says. Yes, amen. Amen. That's why if we make it our business to be exposed to a lot of God's word, we're in a sense of jeopardizing people. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> You're putting your life in your hands because you're going to be held accountable for what you heard. Yes, amen. And if you say you don't want to hear it, then, that, then you're accountable for that too. Yes. So God doesn't just speak in generalities. But I hear something you want to pick up on, that a pers person who's under a system of law, when it comes to thinking about God, they think in terms of generalities. Now you, you'll have to research this out yourself and just see. But they'll speak in terms of generalities. But when God deals with a person, it's not in generalities. It's in specifics. You will know that the Lord initiated this conversation. He started it. Amos didn't start it. And his intent was to make his purpose known, not to find out what Amos's purpose was. Mm -hmm. yeah. See, he didn't open a dialogue with Amos and say, I'd like you to share with me what your, what your particular problems are and what you'd like to do. And yeah. He opened the dialogue to comment about what he was, yeah. Amen. what God was doing. Now, this it seems simple. I know it seems simple. Uh -huh. And if... Several years, few decades ago, it was kind of simple and straightforward, but it's not that way now. You have hard pressed yeah. to find anybody anywhere that thinks that God would deal with you exclusively about what He plans to do. Mm -hmm. Almost always, it's a buddy system yeah. that's being preached. Yeah, Brother Gibbon, a person faithful and is doing working hard for the Lord he wants them to be specific yeah, he right. doesn't want God to deal with him in generalities life is life is filled with specifics there are some generalities too but gen generality is sometimes God will speak about to you about your circumstance but that will not be a pivotal point in your life 
Your circumstances are not what your life pivots on. Yeah. Amen. Like you want to pivot, pivot is where something is balanced on it. Mm -hmm. It'll line properly. It'll stay stay there. But this is this pivot thing that everything depends on can't be your personal circumstances yeah. or, or your personal mm -hmm. desires. It's got to be what God has purpose. That's yeah. God's yeah. got to be what your life pivots on. Yeah. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, give you thanks to God the Father through him. Uh -huh. That's what that's talking about. And that will address all the details yeah. of your yeah. of your life. So tell us, Lord, what what does this basket of fruit mean? The end is come upon my people. Other versions say, the end has come for my people Israel. The time is ripe for my people Israel. My people Israel are now ripe. The end approaches for my people. I'm calling, Message Bible says, I'm calling it quits with my people Israel. The end, when the Lord says the end, <laughs> boy, that's, a, that's kind of a fearsome, yes, now, unless you're reconciled to God, that's a fearsome thought. Most versions do read the end. Some refer to being ripe. But the word translated end here does not mean ripe. It means just what it says. End. At the end of time and extremity. The end. It means just exactly what it says. I understand it. You may apply the word ripe. But the word end is right. And end is stronger than ripe. See, there are good, there are good fruit that's ripe. Yeah, that's right. Well, that's not what's in this basket. What's in this basket's not good fruit. The end. <clears throat> the end refers to a time. Of, the end refers to time, not the people. Now, this is an important distinction. The, the point that the point, the thing that. He's emphasized here is not the state of the people; it's the time. They've been allotted a time to get some good fruit, and they passed the time limit. Mm -hmm. Now, God, this God works this way. Now, a lot of people may have trouble with this, but that's their own business. This this is taught in the Book of Hebrews. Hebrews five twelve. It says, "For the reason of time." You ought to be teachers. You ought to be able to handle the Word of God and teach it to other people for the length of time you've been in Christ. Amen. Well, I've observed from many statements in the book of Hebrews that this is a primary concept. That's, that's right. As You're far right. as the, the size of the book, this comes right smack in the dead center. You're of the exactly book right. Of the letter. Mm. But it's not, it's not a common view, is it? For the time. Just as you, in the earthly life, your child, there's a certain expectation about what will happen through life as they advance. If that doesn't happen, you figure we've got some abnormality here we have to deal with. But it's that way in the kingdom. People that are, remain in a spiritually stupid state for year after year after year, this is a, this is a dangerous thing. Yeah. Because as we see in Israel, there comes a time when the time runs out. Mm -hmm. yeah. yes. Now, when it does, it's not going to be another batch of time assigned, as he's going to point out here. Now, I understand Israel here to be a particular generation of Israelites. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Amen. Israel doesn't refer to all the offspring. Yeah, of Abraham because there's too many promises, but it refers to that particular, the particular generation at that time. That was it for them. That was it. Jesus said that's the way it was when he came. That generation was in the same category. He'd say, uh, do them till I like in this, this generation. He referred to this generation. I give you the text. Noah, he lived in a generation. God said to him, 
He was going to punish this generation. Mm -hmm. Peter told his hearers, save yourselves from this untoward generation. See, there are whole generations that are rejects. I can't identify him, I don't, and I don't want to even try to identify him, but God, yeah. he knows. Solomon spoke about it. He said this in Proverbs 30, verse 11, There is a generation that curseth their father and doth not bless their mother. There is a generation that are pure in their own eyes and yet is not washed from their filthiness. There is a generation, oh, how lofty are their eyes, and their eyelids are lifted up. There is a generation whose teeth as swords, as are as swords, and their jaw teeth as knives, to devour the poor from the earth and the needy from among men. And that generation spans all other generations. Mm -hmm. Jesus told the people of his day that they were part of the generation that killed the prophets. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Hundreds of years before, yes. that generation continued. Uh -huh. There's still, there's still this generation. Mm -hmm. There's a generation that's linked, always has been rejected. If you want to, if you can get up high enough, it, these are the terrors. Yeah, amen. Yeah. yeah. You know what he's referring to? He said it from the blood of Abel. That's right. Yeah. The blood of righteous Zechariah died right. between the altar. Yeah. They were part of that generation. That's right. Yeah. It shall be yeah. counted. Their blood shall be counted right. in this generation. Yeah. Well, it's a fascinating thing to ponder. Mm -hmm. This generation. There are people today whose generation goes back to Cain. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. They, they go back to Israel that murmured in the wilderness. They're part of that generation. Yeah. This is how God reckons things. Uh -huh. Generations aren't always contiguous. Yeah, right. Sometimes there's gaps mm -hmm. in between. But these are the people that Satan is sowing in the earth. God knows who they are. Yeah. You, you don't know who they are. You should, right. you should not try attempt, make an attempt to identify them because this is not what you've been called to do. Yeah, that's right. God, God knows them that are his. Yeah. Your job, let everyone that names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Amen. See, that's, that's our job, depart from iniquity. But know this, there is a generation that God's done working with it. I will not pass by them anymore. Boy, it's a, just the words, are, they're, they jar your soul. This doesn't go very good with, he's the God of second and third chances. No, no. <laughs> I will spare them no longer. I'll never again pass by them, some verses read. God would not labor to retrieve them. He wouldn't spend any more effort. Yes. This is the decision he made. This isn't a decision men made. Amen. But he made this on the basis of what they did. Yes. That's the spirit of deep sleep, deep sleep that Brother Isaac was talking about. He poured out the spirit of deep yes. sleep. That, what, because he ended that terminated his work with them and he was patient he worked right. for hundreds of years before this was done That's right. so no one can say he was, this was hasty or that God wasn't long suffering no one can charge God with that because he faithfully raised up early sent them the prophets mm -hmm. sent the prophets early in sufficient time to warn them but when it was all said and done he pr it will prove see God was righteous in Amen. ending his work with them yes. He, and he, he showed mm -hmm. in their character that he was righteous in, in doing this. I will not pass by them anyway, anymore. Isaiah said, the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hid. Mm -hmm. he, wouldn't, he wouldn't wake them up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no wonder it's written, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. No, no wonder that... That is written in our text, Israel's time, that generation had run out. <laughs> and the songs of the temple, this was all in that basket of fruit. Now, you'd have never yeah. calculated this from yeah. that basket of summer fruit, but it was all, it's all in there. 
And the songs of the temple shall be howlings in that day, saith the Lord. There shall be many dead bodies in every place. They shall cast them forth with silence. <coughs> now these conditions describe God ceasing to work with people. If that's a hard concept to receive, I can only suggest that you ponder it for a while and think upon it because it's, it was illustrated in, in the flood. He, did, he stopped striving. My spirit will not always strive with men. It happened in Sodom and Gomorrah. Yes, it's extreme cases where it happens. We know that. But some of these extreme cases, they can happen and the people don't realize what's happening. Sometimes you can see people getting harder, harder, drawing back further, doing less for the Lord, listening less, putting less of themselves in. See, they're on a dangerous course. They're on a dangerous course because that's where it ends. See, that, that sort of thing doesn't, You've got to get on the road. You see, people get off the road, the highway of holiness. They get, they get off of it. <coughs> Often, the, the, everyone knows, as I mentioned before, everyone knows that the church as a whole is in bad shape. But those who are seeking to address the difficulties often trace it back to other things, maybe the government... Uh, maybe we didn't pray enough, maybe the families aren't good enough, when they trace it back to other causes. But here the cause was they didn't listen to God. Those who are seeking to address these difficulties don't, uh, shouldn't find the answer someplace else. Some in some sociological trend caused all this deterioration. No. <laughs> Here's what I'm going to say. What caused, the, what caused the circumstance was that God left the house. Yeah, yeah. That's the point I'm going to establish. The songs of the temple will be howlings, he said. Wailing. Funeral songs, one version says. This is probably the temple associated with the idol worship at Bethel, but because Judah was involved in this too, it included the one at Jerusalem. And remember when the temple was served as a set in motion, David ordained singers. And they were to sing by lifting up their voice with joy. See, that was, and they were night and day singers. There was 24 hours a day, every day, there were joyful songs emitting from the temple. That's how it was set up. Now, no joyful songs. Wailings. We're not familiar with wailing here in our country. You've learned to subdue our emotions, you know, and this sort of thing. But in other countries, they, they wail. You can hear it for a long way off. Isn't that something that singers night and day? They were established night and day to have an environment of joyful song when you went to the temple. That's how David set it up. <clears throat> Always filled with songs. But now it's going to be filled with wailing. And there's going to be many dead bodies in every place. <laughs> just the, I mean, just it gets your attention to read something like that. There'll be many dead bodies in every place. One version says, the NIV says, many, many dead bodies flung everywhere. There they are. Walk out the door, dead bodies. All around town, dead bodies. They're all over the place. This is an elaboration of the destruction that Amos said would happen in Amos 6, 7, and 10. Remember he said there'd be dead bodies and have to carry them out of the house, yeah, remember? Yeah. Have to carry them out of the house. And there wasn't any place to put them because they couldn't get out, out of the city. And so they just threw them on the street. Just dead bodies They're all over the place yeah. in the street, strewn, dead bodies, many dead bodies, every place. Uh, Jeremiah prophesied of a similar thing to Judah. And the language he uses is very illuminating. This is found in Jeremiah 8, 2. They shall spread them. These are the, the bones here. They, they got all the bones. 
and they spread them before the sun and the moon and all the host of heaven whom they have loved, whom they have served, and after whom they have walked, and whom they have sought, and whom they have worshipped. They shall not be gathered, nor be buried. They shall be for dung upon the face of the earth. Similar. So this, these dead bodies were to the world like dung is to a field. Yeah. It was a disgrace. Disgrace. The major reason for this address is going to be a delineated in the next next clause. This is going to be because God has made an end. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I made an end. No! I'm done with generation, this generation. And as a result, this is what's going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. There's going to be wailing in the temple and dead bodies all around. Mm -hmm. And they'll cast them forth in silence. That is, no one's going to be able to, like, comment on this. There'll be no newscaster with a running commentary on it. It, it won't be that kind of thing. There'll be such grief and such an appalling spirit that nobody will be able to even talk, talk about it. It will cast them forth in silence. Now, the primary thing in Jerusalem is going to be handling the dead. That's going to now be the premier occupation handling the dead. All right, now I'm going to do a, make a parallel here. The parallel in our time is too grievous for words. The primary work of the church is feed the flock, build them up in the faith, edify them so the church can edify itself in love. All right, that's the... That's the main work that God has ordained. But since God's pulled out, the main work yeah. is handling the dead. That's right. Am I not right? Yeah. Amen. The problem solvers, these are the main people. Yeah. Uh -huh. The counselors, uh -huh. these are the main people. The recovery experts, uh -huh. these are the main people. What are they doing? They're handling the dead. Yeah. The main job of the modern church is what do you do with all the dead? So they try and get some other new people in that they pretty soon die too because it's a deadly environment. See, the modern church is a deadly environment. When I say modern church, I don't mean everybody that goes to church. That's not what I mean. I mean nominal churches, which means church by name only. There are places where, where death is cultured. Hardly anyone is able to see that this condition is the result of God not being there. Hardly anybody can make that correlation. But that's, a, that's what's happened here. That, this is what's going to happen after the end. He's not describing a current situation. He's describing what will happen because God said, I'm not going to pass by them anymore. I'm not going to be among them anymore. I'm not going to teach him and lead him anymore. No more prophets. I'm going to stop it now. It's going to be a spiritual dearth. And because of that, this is what's going to happen. Yeah. Amen. Now I'm suggesting that what's happened, I reserve the right to be wrong. I hope I am, but I don't, I don't think I am. God has pulled out of the church because of its appetite for the things of the world yeah. because it has largely rejected the resources he's provided he's pulled out mm -hmm. and they've fallen to the bottom yeah. and now we got dead bodies every place yeah, right. you're working for the Lord you go to Timbuktu you find dead bodies uh -huh. You go to Pakistan, you find dead bodies. Go to Kenya, dead bodies. Burkina Faso, dead bodies. They're all over. Dead bodies. And they're the result of God leaving a certain generation. Say, so what is the solution to all of this? Well, 
Paul says, Be ye separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. That's what he said to the church. 2 Corinthians 6. That's what he said to the church. Which means he wasn't receiving Corinth as they were. I'll receive you. But if you don't, it's going to get worse. And I'm suggesting that's what has happened in Christendom. It's not, it's not enough just to complain about it, I understand. We've got to identify the Amos's. Like, what do you see? <laughs> We've got to find out who's got, who's seen something and nurture, nurture that life, build that life up. Wherever you find people that have an interest but they've just never been taught anything, lead them, teach them properly, tell, tell them about what God has done. There's people like, there's Cornelius's. Yeah, there's there's people that, like Lydia. There's pe there's people in like the Samaritans that are ready to believe, but they just yes, amen. they just haven't heard anything. Right. We're not talking about those kind of people. Mm -hmm. We're talking about people that have heard, have made some advance, uh -huh. and they went back. Yeah, right. yeah. They got out of Egypt, mm -hmm. yeah. but they went back in their hearts. See? Mm -hmm. They crossed the Red Sea, they really did, yeah. Yeah. but then they went backward. And God is patient, long-suffering, hundreds of years. <laughs> Finally, he said, Amos, yeah. I'm done with this generation. Mm -hmm. Well, it's just something to consider. Yeah. Yeah. Any of you have something you'd like to add? Just at the bottom. This space that the Lord allowed, the time that the Lord gave them that had expired, he's the one that determined the That's time. Right. That's mm -hmm. right. And the time that he determines is sufficient That's right. for a work to be done. And so mm -hmm. he that's why he's the one that can cut it off that's when right. the time is over. Now, speaking from my own viewpoint, I think I've been too quick in the past to write people off. Yeah. Considering yeah. that the Lord was done working with them, but that is not our place. That's, that's right. right. Amen. The Lord does not tell others the time he's allowed for another person. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, Granted, sometimes it's going to be evident because of the Lord's judgment or something of that nature. But I think that we need to be very cautious because the Lord is the one that made that decision and not we ourselves. We can Amen. do labor where there's a, a labor to be made. Well, they're, they're discovered like Paul when he went into the uh -huh. synagogue of Antioch of Pisidia. Uh -huh. He didn't know the conditions of that synagogue. Yeah. So he preached a message that would discover. Yes, amen. That's the answer. That's right. you, you deliver a message that is God's remedy to whatever. Yes, and if that message is consistently rejected, uh -huh. then you don't have to pass final judgment, but yes. it's time to go. That's right. Amen. Jesus told if they don't if they don't receive you, dust, dust yes. your feet off or go someplace else. Amen. That's what he said. And you are freed mm -hmm. from any obligation to make yeah. final judgments. This yeah. is not, as Sister Barbara said, this is not our place. That's right. Sometimes you can you can detect that God's about to take someone's life, sometimes, but then they, their spirit may be saved. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Remember that he said that at Corinthian formally it said is deliver him to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that his spirit may be saved. So that just kind of tells you, well, it's, you can't just figure out a regimented way about thinking about this. This right. is all in God's hands. Amen. All you can do is deal with what you're responsible for. And you're responsible for delivering the message. And yes. when you're dealing with someone that's fallen away, enter into it with fear. Yes. Hate even the garment spotted by the flesh. Don't go in feeling sorry for people. Uh, amen. That's right. Don't go in that way. Uh -huh. Save with fear. It didn't mean scare them into the kingdom. I mean, you're the one that's supposed to have the fear because you're amen. you're dealing with someone who's under Satan's dominion. That's right. So you amen. walk, but so you got to deliver a, a message that Satan can't do anything with. Yeah. See. 
And it is a message of uh, it is a message of hope. Amen. Anyone else? Yes, Brother Jonathan. Well, I can see in this there's definitely a great danger in hardening your heart when such a when we're living in such a generation. I mean, I remember the plague of the frogs in Egypt. It says that the Lord, when He released the frogs, says they all died. To gather them all people, the land stank. It stank. Yeah. Well, a generation can stink. Can stink. Yeah. That's right. But like Pharaoh, in spite of that, they still can harden their hearts. That's right. And it just shows the old. Then that just brought more judgments upon them. So I know that in a generation like this, where the Lord's departing, it's not a time to be casual or no. in a state where you're going to harden your own heart. And I say it. What Sister Barb was talking about, when Paul warned the Hebrews about this, he said, but we're persuaded of better things. See, there you are. See, he had this, that there had been a beginning. Yes, that's right. So we're persuaded of better things of you and things that accompany salvation. Yeah, so, but he had, to tell, he had to tell them this message, though. See, that, mm -hmm. that this is a situation that you have, you have to take this matter seriously. You have to press in, draw near, fight the good fight of faith. You've got to do this. And even after you've done all that, God still is the one that's got to save you. Amen. Yeah. Anyone else? All right. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that this passage is in the Scripture. We thank you that it has not violated your own righteousness, but has alerted us to the necessity of sobriety, and strong faith and the commitment of our lives to you. And we pray that you would give us this uh, grace to do this consistently and with a degree of personal satisfaction. In Jesus' name, amen.